So a question for all of you, you all come at it from a different perspective, and I think the governors want to hear and get your input and advice from, uh, from where you're coming from. Where do you think, get, you know, with your perspective, where are our systems and processes falling short, and, and where, where can states seize on opportunities to kind of improve on our infrastructure? Okay, uh, thank you. So you, with uh, the opening remarks that I had in working to reduce our environmental footprint, particularly in energy, because energy drives so much of the economy and the infrastructure, I think we all have the same goals to reduce the environmental footprint as fast as possible. What I would say what goes on in the states, and some of this will be what uh, Doug talked about in the permitting, is that restrictive permitting and local ordinances and other uh, issues such as that in the states sometimes actually has the unintended consequence while we're trying to get to that same end goal. If we want to reduce as fast as possible, we actually end up with some of the permitting issues increasing greenhouse gases, increasing our pollution, and actually having our aging infrastructure not be able to be replaced in a timely manner. So certainly streamlining of permitting. Nobody's looking for any kind of rubber stamp, but a clear, consistent, reliable, and timely process is essential. We're investing $26 billion, and to be able to do that, to be able to finance it, it's just critical that there is that clear process to be able to go through. And then sometimes to understand and accept that if we want to get to that end goal and we want to try to do it as quickly as possible, we need to be able to install and keep running our base load, high efficiency, dispatchable generation if we want the most rapid deployment of renewables possible, which is, I believe, what everybody wants. Good points. Doug? Yeah, let me make two points. The, the first is a knowledge of what are the assets that are in your state. You would be surprised at how many states have not, don't have a centralized organization. It's, it's dispersed across the entire state of what are the assets, what are the bridges, what are the ports, what, what are the even buildings that are owned. This is something that's absolutely critical. The, the state of Pennsylvania, I see uh, Governor Wolf over here, they put together a program where they have a concession for 558 bridges. So as a bundling of their bridge assets to have them maintained and rebuilt over a period that was about a third of what have, would have taken if it would not have been done in the, by the private sector. So there's, but you could have never done that if you didn't have the inventory of the assets. In addition, the financial markets are looking for an inventory, so to speak, of po projects in a pipeline. Uh, Governor Cuomo would not have been able to perform the uh, project at LaGuardia to renew the airport there if there hadn't been a pipeline of projects which were known by the financial markets that are coming up in New York State that they can start planning for. So the first is having inventory assets and a pipeline of projects. And the second is really about how do you think about infrastructure? In too many places, I've seen infrastructures thought about as procurement. It's the annual budget cycle, and it's not an annual budget cycle. Infrastructure has to be thought of as a life cycle investment over the long term. So the word investment, not procurement. States need to look at as an investment in infrastructure and all the benefits it brings, not as annual procurement. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I, I think uh, taking a proactive versus a reactive approach, and I, I think about a term that we use at Amazon often, and it's uh, looking around corners. And I'll give uh, two examples, uh, Florida and Illinois, as it relates to our business. And I, I use the, I guess, the, the famous quote from Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And I think about the facility that we're building right now in Lakeland, Florida, that will launch this summer, as well as our expansion that we just completed last year in Rockford, Illinois, where we partnered with the, the airport and the, the local, state, and federal government representatives uh, to really do something that was mutually beneficial for both the business as well as the local community and the state. So uh, they leaned in, uh, did an investment before we really were committed to um, uh, operating out of those sites and it, it became a, a great uh, relationship and, and partnership uh, between uh, our Amazon Air organization and uh, the Rockford and, and uh, Lakeland communities. Thank you. So, Doug, um, public-private partnerships have been around for a while, but they're still, as you mentioned, fairly underutilized. Um, and some states are taking advantage, some are not. 
how, and, and it's a discussion some of us are having, how should states evaluate whether or not a P3 might be something they ought to consider? How should they balance the risks between the public and private sector? Well, this, the one of the words you used, risk, is, is critical, and I'll, I'll come to that. So first of all, the public-private partnerships, I think they become an imperative because states don't have the financial resources to undertake the amount of infrastructure investment which is going to be required to meet the needs of, of Amazon and Dominion. If you think about where we're going to be heading with the modernizing our infrastructure, updating it, and we also heard that there is a, there is a demand from my children and uh, new generations coming up to have a completely different approach to the environment and sustainability of our infrastructure. And when you look at that renewal, having the public-private partnership is, is one of the best ways to do that. So when you look at it, first of all, it, you can use it for financing. You can use it for models of design. You have them here in your, in your uh, foundational principles. And to put together this uh, approach, when I uh, worked as the co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, Executive Committee on Infrastructure, we put in place a ideal or a draft of a proposed uh, P3 law, that which we think all states could look at to see if the, if the P3 law they already have is going to meet these standards or if they don't have one, they can use this as a base standard uh, for a, a P3 law. In addition to financing, you have the idea of risk sharing. Who's going to take the risk? You can put the risk back to the private sector. The private sector is willing to underwrite projects and take risk much more than they would uh, if it's if they were not going to operate. So there's an opportunity to bring the financing, to have the, to have the risk sharing. And, and then one of the things you have to overcome, though, is it's, it's still true that people think that infrastructure should be owned by the government. There's this question about who does have the responsibility for infrastructure. And through a P3 law, you can be very clear about what are the, what are the roles and risks and responsibilities along the entire value chain of infrastructure. And good P3 laws also define very specific who's taking the risk, who has the responsibility, and you can transfer that to the public sector, to the private sector. Great, thank you. Um, Diane, so uh, you talked to something about investing in some of the serious technological advances in your industry. Can you talk a little bit about some of the innovations and, and technologies that you're most focused on? Sure, I'd probably put it into two categories. For those technologies that have been deployed for a while right now, how can you drive down the cost? How can you improve the efficiency? So as a couple of examples, you think about the car you're driving and the fuel efficiency or the computers you're buying are so much cheaper and a lot more uh, you know, juice in them and you get so much more memory than you used to. So offshore wind, just 10 years ago, if we would put in a wind turbine on land, it was less than one megawatt. We now have two test turbines going in and offshore Virginia that are now six megawatts. And the ones that we will be installing in the largest offshore wind facility that we just announced are going to be 12 megawatts or even more. So the, the newer technology, so you think in the same environmental footprint, investing in that technology to drive costs down and uh, the scale and the size up, having more solar uh, power be created with a smaller environmental footprint. So we're investing and focusing a lot of those technologies to be able to get more. The uh, advanced combined cycles for natural gas are 25, 30% more efficient than they were just 10 years ago, so fuel efficiency. Then it's focusing on new technologies that can really drive us down to a new level in greenhouse gases and pollution and energy, such as energy storage and batteries, hydrogen, advanced nuclear, those types of technologies that are not here yet, but we need to be able to pilot and drive those to be able to really move our energy economy forward. Thank you. Um, Sarah, from a shipping and freight perspective, uh, what are some of the emerging technology opportunities for states to enhance efficiency and maybe reduce congestion or speed up sure. delivery? Uh, well, first of all, I would, I would encourage states to, to use data and facts and leverage things like technology and machine learning to, first of all, provide an informed set of information to then drive informed decisions. Uh, that's the approach that we've taken. And, and for example, um, 
instead of uh, building out an air haul network that's a traditional hub and spoke where all the aircraft fly into one location, everything's sorted and then they fly out, we actually have an overlay of hub and spoke and a point to point network that is a result of really complex algorithms to drive a simple solution which has resulted in a reduction in the number of aircraft actually required to fly the same amount of packages. So it's uh, good from a sustainability perspective, it's good for efficiency, it's, it's good for cost. Uh, so out of out of data and information came uh, the decision to build out our network like that. Uh, and also, just to touch on sustainability, uh, we're certainly leaning in in that space as well. Uh, we're investing in electric uh, ground service equipment. Uh, I think about our facility at Alliance Fort Worth in Texas. We have the, uh, we are the launch customer of the world's first electric main deck loader. So the piece of equipment that loads the containers onto our large 767 aircraft. So it's been great really uh, experimenting and trialing that type of of technology and equipment in our in our space. Great, thank you. At this point, we're going to open it up to uh, that, let some of our other governors get into the discussion. So, uh, yeah, please, we want to just get, light up some lights and and start asking some questions of our panelists. Governor Cuomo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor Hogan, and thank you to all the members of the panel. Uh, P3, as you said, uh, and Governor Hogan said, it's been around a long time, and uh, money is a problem, right, on top of everything else, the permitting, et cetera. Uh, what do you think are the most, have replicable models developed on the P3 process, and what are the most replicable P3s that you've done? Uh, well, first of all, I have, uh, when we did the Bipartisan Policy Center, we went and did field trips to different cities. We went to Detroit, to Miami, to Long Beach, to New York. Uh, we went to Virginia and visited Richmond. And what we saw were different examples of what works in a P3. And I, I mentioned earlier that one of the most important aspects is to think about it as an investment, not through procurement. And when you do a P3, it actually forces you into that methodology because you're saying that this project, which is going to be managed with a public-private partnership, requires a different sort of a discipline when it just is a procurement project. So just having the project itself is critical. Another aspect is, is what is included in this infrastructure for success, the foundation for success, is a definition of all the different uh, aspects along the way. There's a design aspect, there's a build aspect, there's an operate aspect, there's a finance aspect, a maintain aspect, uh, the transfer either privately run after or before. And so there's different models, there's best practices, the, the uh, Port of Miami, the tunnel at the Port of Miami, the, the Long Beach, uh, the Long Beach uh, city, uh, city Courthouse, the uh, Port in Richmond, Virginia, you, you have LaGuardia in New York. So there are a lot of very good practices that could be learned and copied. Usually we hear about the failures, and there are some failures, there's some roads that failed. And um, just to echo the comments about uh, data and analytics, there are now more than ever opportunities to use data and analytics for different sorts of variable pricing. We're looking now, I live in New York, and we're looking in New York how we're going to have different sorts of variable pricing in the city. Hong Kong and Singapore have variable pricing. London has it. It works for transit. So there's a lot of models, and one of the best things to do working with Governor Hogan would be to get a group together of governors, and we'd, be, we'd love to work with you to find all of those best practices and share them across all the states. Thank you. You guys are being much too quiet. We have an opportunity to talk to some really smart experts here. You guys have to wake up, <laughs> ask some questions. Well, while you're thinking of your next question, I'll, uh, I'll fill in and ask another one then. We're here. You have a question. Go ahead. Governor, please. So Guam is way out in the Pacific Ocean and uh, we have a lot of uh, sun out there. Can you speak to the role of uh, solar energy in this whole um, process and presentation that you made? Uh, sure, it, it plays an absolute critical role in uh, being able to move towards a, a net zero or zero carbon economy. Uh, and be able to address decarbonization. Uh, so you know, we've been putting in uh, about you know, 1,000 megawatts of solar a year. So it certainly plays a role. Um, but 
battery technology really needs to be coupled with it, and I would give you twofold. There's the batteries that a lot of the technology for batteries has started from the electric vehicle sector. So it does tend to be four to eight hour batteries. Very helpful for a lot of the picture, but to be able to have a secure, reliable energy grid, need to actually have multi-day storage also. So if there does happen to be a storm that goes through uh, for several days, batteries with solar can handle an enormous amount. So by installing that rapidly, as California and North Carolina and other states have started to do, it can address decarbonizing very quickly, but to have a secure grid, you do need to have multi-day storage and dispatchable baseload generation partnering with it as you continue that journey. I'll, I'll add as well, uh, I think about our fulfillment centers that I mentioned. We have solar panels on top of over 50 fulfillment centers across the United States, including on top of uh, Governor Hogan's fulfillment center in Baltimore. Uh, we're building out a large central hub at the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport, and we're planning on putting solar panel on top of that facility as well to put energy back into the grid. Uh, so it's certainly uh, something that we're thinking about uh, both uh, on the, the business and commercial side in addition to the utilities. So um, a, several of you touched on uh, kind of the regulatory uh, landscape and permitting the uh, regulatory process. Um, and, and it's an issue that we hear a lot about, um, both at the federal and state level. And so, and it's something governors are concerned about and the private sector is concerned about. What, what do you see as some of the opportunities for governors uh, uh, to, to, to support streamlining uh, and bringing about maybe more transparency and, and a, a clear process uh, for per the permitting and uh, for infrastructure? And so, so what I've seen is that the, the fastest way to do it is to require there be a single approval process, single permitting process that you can't get lost across multiple agencies. This is where it's worked in, in some states. And as an example right now um, is at the federal government, there's something called the FAST Act. The FAST Act is, was something the last two administrations have both tried to find ways to increase infrastructure. The FAST Act has sped up infrastructure approvals by 2.3 years and saved uh, billions of dollars by being able to get the infrastructure in uh, case moving much faster. But for me, the most important thing is to streamline the approvals and get one agency to own the approvals and if it needs to go to multiple agencies it has to be done in a way that it gets streamlined and, and sped up it's this is definitely the most frustrating thing when you speak with the construction companies with the financial institutions with the designers uh, with architects with et cetera, et cetera. They, the thing they're most frustrated with is permitting uh, I, I would add in there a just the consistency of process. Be clear what the process is. It is based on these regulations, these laws, with a target time frame with which there can be some certainty to be able to start investing. With these large infrastructure projects, you are investing years before you put it in and you hire the construction contractors. And so when the time frames go or the process isn't clear, it ends up extending on for a very long time. So clarity of process and consistent, clear time frames. Can I add one more other sure. point, which is since we have all the, uh, so many governors here, sometimes the other aspect that really slows it down is when an infrastructure project crosses state boundaries. So if you have a bridge or a tunnel that goes between two states, that also can really slow it down because sometimes you're going to have two states with their approval processes with multiple agencies on both sides of the border. Maybe there's county approvals, city approvals, et cetera. And you look across all the different agencies approving it, it, it can be very difficult. So I'd also recommend that the governors, in the spirit of this uh, new program, find ways to cooperate when infrastructure crosses uh, state boundaries. Well, it's a very good point. We we're, were just in the process. We've just approved a, a major uh, interstate agreement with the state of Virginia on the cap Capitol Beltway here surrounding Washington. Governor Northam and I are doing a new American Legion bridge that connects the two states across the Potomac River. 
I had a good discussion yesterday with many of the Canadian premiers who are going to be joining us in the next panel about uh, bridges connecting across borders. Uh, and it's, so it's a big discussion uh, about how we do this. It's difficult enough to get infrastructure done within a state, but when you're dealing across states uh, and across uh, international borders, it's even more confusing. Uh, and dealing with local governments as well. Yep, Hogan. Yep. First, uh, Sarah, I think you omitted notice that you are, I think, the first female F-18 combat pilot. So not bad from a girl from Butte. No. Sure. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> And also, though, one of the things he did say is, like, when you're looking at where to place something, you do look at the base infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we see that in business. We also see that in the livability of our communities. That's why so many of the state governors, like, we passed our largest infrastructure package in our state's history a year ago. Over 30 states have increased the gas tax um, at the state level just in the last six years. Uh, but states can't do this alone, either. All of you that think about this a lot, in addition to permitting reform, what do you think our country's expectations and governor's expectations should be out of the federal government when it comes to more comprehensive infrastructure package? Yeah, I, I look at this uh, as their federal government does have a critical role, especially in roads, ports, airports. We talk about you're in the you're in the, the flight industry, you're in the natural gas and energy industry. This is where you also have national interests. Uh, when it comes to the the uh, FAA, we're looking at what will be the the current system to manage air travel and air traffic controller. And the system is it's pretty old. There needs to be a comprehensive effort. It could never be done. Done by the states. The only way you could ever up, upgrade and update the entire air traffic control system in the United States would have to be done by the federal government. Similarly, the road system, there's a, the last time the, uh, that the uh, transportation uh, bill was passed, there was a convoluted way to find financing for it. The states need to put pressure on the federal government to build the roads that are the, the uh, national road system. Uh, the same goes with some of the rail systems. So the national government does have a critical ro a role to play, especially in transportation. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panel for this wonderful discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Really good. Thanks, Governor.